thank you, Pacific West Baptist College. Well, have your Bible open, please, at the Gospel of John in chapter 21. John in 21. <clears throat> How many here know what it means, what we mean by the expression, to fall in love? To fall in love. Can I see your hand if you know what that expression means? Hardly anyone, eh? Come on now. Don't be shy. Some of you are in the process of that, falling. <laughs> All righty. Well... There's a lot of um, people that with a lot of different theories and ideas on what it means to fall in love. And they have their chemical equations and, you know, how the body produces chemicals and others have, you know, the psychological uh, look at it. But did you know that expression is nowhere found in the Bible? It's nowhere found in the Bible. Today, we're going to look at these words of the Lord Jesus. And we're going to look at some other scriptures. We're going to come back to them. But uh, if you look at it once again, in verse 15, here the Lord Jesus was speaking to the Apostle Peter, and he asked him, Lovest thou me more than these? Hmm, interesting. I wonder what he meant. Well, let's find out. Let's first, let's have a word of prayer together. Loving Father, please teach us today. It's a simple question that Jesus asked of one of his disciples, and yet it's eternally recorded in the word of God so it must be for us too Lord help us to understand the love of God the love of Christ and to love Christ the way he loves us help us with that today and please make a change in our lives because of it some of us Lord are working hard for you some of us could be working a little harder Lord I pray that all of us would do our very best our our highest, our utmost for the master. So please bless the message, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to suggest to you that uh, love is something that we all experience, but it's not really something that you per se fall into. Some people, they, they tell you, boy, this week I fell in love. Just give them a week or two, well, I fell out of love. They fall into it and they fall out. How can you fall into something and then fall out of the very same thing? I've never been able to grasp the dynamic of that. You might be able to fall in and climb out, but how can you fall into something? It's like, you know, the old stories of, oh, no, I was a boy, oh, we had it tough. We had to walk to school seven miles uphill, both ways, to school and back, and, you know, on and it goes. And um, how do you fall into something and then fall out of the very same thing? I'm not too sure about that. But I do believe that uh, love is something that can be found. You can find love. And at the same time, you can lose it as well. It can be found and lost. Um, let's uh, put a little bookmark there because we'll be coming back to um, John 21. And let's go to the book of Revelation. And we have uh, our Lord Jesus delivering um, a message to uh, one of the seven churches, and it's the first one, the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus was a great church. Make no doubt about it. It was a really wonderful church. But uh, over the years, uh, it may have been like 50 years uh, or something like that, that it had been in existence. By this time, some of the um, early Christians, the early leaders had gone home to glory. Others had taken their their place, but the church at Ephesus was still there, and it was still doing a great job, only something changed, something was different, and the Lord wrote this letter, and he said here uh, in verse 2, he says, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil, which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and found them liars, you believe that? There were liars 2,000 years ago, oh! <gasps> Can you imagine that? Not everyone was pure and honest 2,000 years ago. And guess what? It's worse today, isn't it? It's, it's worse today. It seems. And so uh, verse 3, Jesus continues and he says, And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Now all those are good things. There's about, uh, oh, ten, ten items here that uh, Jesus lists. Now, verse 4, 
He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Oh, oh, here it comes. Now, what could he possibly have against the church like that? He says, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. Love is something that can be found. It's something that can be lost. But guess what? It's something that can be left behind. Love can be left behind. Now, that's biblical. Falling into love, falling out of love is not biblical. But finding love and leaving love behind, that's biblical. That's, uh, that's truth is what I'm trying to say. And here it's applied to God's people. These are not the heathen that God is talking to. Jesus is not writing a letter to the pagan uh, idol worshipers. He's writing a letter to a church of saved people. People that uh, have walked with the Lord for many years. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes this happens that when someone gets saved, boy, they're hot, man, they're excited. They come to the services. Uh, they come at 10 o'clock. They say, this is fantastic. Uh, when do we do this again? And we say, we, at 11 o'clock. Okay, and then they're here for the 11 o'clock service, and they're just pumped. They say, this is fantastic. When do we do this again? And we say, at 6 o'clock tonight. And so they come Sunday night at 6 o'clock to the evening service, and they're excited about it, and they sing the hymns, and they're pumped, and they say, man, this is great. When do we do this again? We say, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. And so they come Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and they sing the hymns and they're part of the Bible study and the prayer and rejoicing. And when it's all over, they say, man, this is fantastic. When do we do this again? And we say, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. That's our soul winners. And so they come to that. And they say, when do we do this again? Well, we start over again tomorrow, Sunday morning. Well, what happens after uh, several weeks, several months or something? Now they don't come to all of the services. They skip a service here and skip a service there. And then six months, 12 months go by. Maybe they just go to one service a week. Maybe two services, something like that. Sometimes it's one service a month, something like that. Now, I'm not talking about people that have shift work and have to work uh, at the hospital, you know, on Sundays, you know, weird shifts and things like that. But this is a common pattern, folks. You see, what happens is love gets left behind. That's really the bottom line. Other things start replacing it. And uh, the same is true, I think, the world over in many, many areas. Now, this very thing is not a, a, new, a new phenomena with the New Testament church. This happened with God's people way back in the Old Testament as well. Let's go there, back to uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, the book of Isaiah. We're not going to take a whole bunch of time here. Uh, but I want you to go to Isaiah 43. These books, Isaiah and Jeremiah, are worthy to be read. Wow. There's a lot of fantastic uh, stories in here, true stories and the history of God's people. And unfortunately, a lot of their failings and God used the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. They came one after the other. They didn't ever knew each other, but they came one after the other and they preached God's word. And in about 690 B.C., give or take approximately, you have um, um, these words here in Isaiah chapter 43. And let's look at verse 21. Here's God speaking. And he says, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. That means they haven't been praying. Thou hast, not been, thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. That probably means that they've not been keeping up what they're supposed to be doing. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings. Neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, uh, nor weary thee with incense. Watch this, verse 24. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money. That's candy. That's what that is. You've brought me no candy. Isn't that interesting? God would say that. Neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Wow. These are God's people he's talking to. Not the pagan, not the heathen. These are God's people. Isn't that something? Now go over to Jeremiah uh, to the right. Chapter 2. Now, these words happen approximately 620, 6, 
25, whatever, B.C. The very approximate with the dates there. But chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2. Here's the word of the Lord. Verse 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. Oh, look at this. I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Verse 3, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. Isn't that something? These are sweet words God was saying. Oh, listen, God says, I remember you in years gone by. I remember you in your former days when you first came to know me as Savior and how happy you were. I remember the smile on your face. I remember the tear in your eye when you repented and got saved. I was there. I, I know the very day, the year, the moment, the very second in time when you got saved. When you invited me into your heart. And we, we made a great team, says God. Boy, those were wonderful days. Whatever happened to those days, God is saying. Look in the verse, uh, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and have become vain. Why don't we walk together anymore, says God? Why don't we spend time together with the, with the Bible like we used to? Hmm? Why don't we meet together in the house of the Lord like we used to? What happened? Where's the joy? Where's the joy? Interesting, isn't it? Israel was holiness unto the Lord. They went after him. Israel actually went after God. And what usually happens is that when uh, the cooling off, now God has to go after his people and say, why have you left me? What iniquity have you found in me? Now, if you would turn back to Revelation, on the heels of those verses in Isaiah and Jeremiah, I think we can have a better look again at Revelation chapter 2. And he begins with all this wonderful, glowing testimony of good things in verses 2 and 3. There's 10 of them there. I know thy works and thy labor. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that something that that could happen? And yet that's exactly what happened. The church got so busy. The people in the church got busy with their busy lives. And before you know it, the real love, the real heartbeat for God has been left behind. And it's sort of business as usual. Oh, yeah, it's Sunday tomorrow. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Hey, where's my Bible? I, I, I'm going to need my Bible. Honey, have you seen my Bible? And then Sunday morning comes. Oh, is it ever early? Man, got to get out of bed. And we drag ourselves into the house of the Lord for 10 o'clock. But the next day is Monday. We've got to be at work for 8. And that doesn't seem to be a problem. Got to be at school for 8 o'clock. Get on that school bus. Or get in the car and drive. That doesn't seem to be a problem. But to try and make it to God's house for 10 or even 11. Oh. Tribulation. Whereas there was a time when it was joy. When it was pleasure. To come into the house of the Lord with joy and happiness. And that's what God, I think, is saying here. And Jesus is talking to one of the better churches here. And he says, you've left your first love. It's what you've done here. You've left your first love. You know, it's sad when two people leave their love for each other, isn't it? Here, the first love was to be with Jesus. It was to think about Jesus. It was to serve and live one's life for Jesus. Uh, you know, if you've been blessed to, to have someone in your life that loves you and you've married them, um, think for a minute, think back, be it a year or 50 years, 20 years, you met someone for the first time who believed in you and trusted in you. And they laughed at your jokes. They held your hand. Your heart and mind were filled with with thoughts of them all through the day. You could hardly wait to be with them. You dressed up, maybe 
She dressed up for him. Maybe he went and held the car door for her. Maybe you remember your first kiss and how tender a moment that was. And finally you stood together and you vowed to love each other till death do us part. What happened? What happened? Have we left our first love behind? Now think about this. You folks that are married, if you treated each other back then the same way you treat each other now, Okay, can you follow that line of reasoning? The way you treat each other now. If you treated each other the same way years ago when you first met, you think you would have gone ahead and got married? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Because sometimes changes take place, not so good changes, and love is left behind. How many here have ever heard of a... Um, well, it's a movie, it's a famous movie, Fiddler on the Roof. Can I see your hand? Fiddler on the Roof. Now, that's not even half the crowd. Well, you need to watch that. It originally, I think originally it came from a book, but it was made in 1964 to be a Broadway production, Fiddler on the Roof. Um, it was all about the Jews in a little town in Russia uh, living under the oppression of the Tsar, it, it took place something like 1905, something like that, about 115 years ago, give or take. The, one of the main characters in the story is this likable milkman, and his name is Tevia. He's got five daughters. And at one point in this little movie, uh, he heard about this new thing called love. He'd been trying to maintain the tradition, traditions, and trying to raise his daughters and so on. And he was challenged with this thought of, uh, of love. And so he's reflecting on this newfangled emotion. And he turns to his wife, Goldie. And he says, um, do you love me? Does that ring a bell for anyone? Yes? Two hands. Oh, come on, folks. Get sentimental with me. He turns to her and says, do you love me? Sing it with me, huh? Do you love me? Now, they've been married 25 years. And she turns to him and says, do I love you? And she says, you're upset. Maybe it's indigestion. Go lie down. That's how she answers him. But he's persistent. Do you love me? And so she finally starts thinking, do I love him? She says, for 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Good words, huh? <laughs> Anyhow, they conclude the song by realizing, yeah, they do love each other. And then they say, after 25 years, it's nice to know. How long have you been saved? How many years has it been? Two years? 20 years? More than 20? 40 years? How long have you been saved? Some of you got saved as just youngsters. Some of you saved as adults. How many years have you been saved now? Maybe you've been saved 25 years. Do you love him? For 25 years I've gone to church, said my prayers, sung the hymns, read my Bible. After 25 years, why well, talk about love right now? I can't do as good a job as those <laughs> professionals can, but you get the idea? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? The Lord Jesus wrote a letter to one of his best churches, and he said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Thou hast left thy first love. It happens slowly, folks. It doesn't happen, boom, like that. It happens little by little by little. Here a little miss, there a little plot. Here something, there something, before you know it. 
You leave your first love in the dust. Other things have taken your fancy. Work, children. Nothing wrong with work, nothing wrong with children. But where's Jesus? We get into a routine. Wow. Isn't that something? Very true, very true. Revelation 2, verse 4. Thou hast left thy first love. I want to tell you uh, a true story about a psychologist named Dr. George Crane. He was an, also a newspaper columnist. Dr. Dr. Crane told a story of a, a wife who came into his office. He was a psychologist. She came to see him, full of hatred toward her husband. Ooh, she hated that man. I don't only want to get rid of him, she said. I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he's hurt me. That's what she told Dr. Crane. Dr. Crane nodded in agreement. And he suggested an ingenious plan. Boy, have I got a plan for you, ma'am. She was all ears. Tell me about it. He said, what you want to do is go home and act. Act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent quality he has. Go out of your way to be as kind and considerate and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe that you love him. And after you've convinced him, drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce and that'll really hurt him more than anything else. Well, I tell you, with revenge in her eyes. She smiled and she said, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? She left the office and she left with enthusiasm. For two months, she showed love and kindness and listening and giving and reinforcing and sharing. And then she never came back to Dr. Crane's office. So he managed to get her on the phone. And uh, he said, uh, are you ready to go through with the divorce now? And she said, divorce? Never, she said. I discovered I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as often repeated deeds. Interesting story, isn't it? I wonder if one of the reasons why so many Christians leave their first love, don't seem to love Jesus as much anymore, is simply because they're not doing anything for him. They're not serving him. I think it, it's illustrated in this story here. Now let's go back to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And let's look at something quite interesting on the heels of that that story by Dr. Crane. His full name was uh, George Washington Crane. That was his full name. He died in 1995, about 94 years old, too. John chapter 21. Let's look again here. This is after they had a nice meal, a nice fish dinner together. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now the word for love that Jesus used was the word agape. And it's the highest form of love. You don't get any higher form of love than agape. And it's the kind of love that you're willing to sacrifice yourself for your, your loved one. Be it your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father. You love them with an agape. If you're a father or a mother here today, how much do you love your children? What would you do for them? If they had needs, would you sacrifice? Would you do whatever it takes to be a blessing to them? That's the kind of word agape means. And Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me with an agape? Now, he said, do you love me more than these? 
See, what are the these? Well, if you go back here, verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, that's the rest of the apostles, I go a fishing. Peter was a professional fisherman, and he knew all about how to fish. And so verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and 3. And then Jesus says, do you love me more than these? And I think what Jesus was saying is, you're a fisherman and a good fisherman. Your daddy was a fisherman. I think your grandfather was a fisherman too. It's like fish swim in your blood. I'll bet you drink cod liver oil. Boy, you got to be dedicated to drink that stuff, right? Oh. But do you love me more than all of that? Do you love me more than all that put together? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? I think that is the immediate meaning of what Jesus is saying here. Now, Simon Peter answered him. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now, the word for love that Peter chose was not agape. It was philia. Philia, which is like a brotherly or a sisterly kind of affection, one toward another. It's not an agape. It's a, a, philia is a love that says, Hey, you're a nice person. I don't mind being around you. I wouldn't sacrifice my life for you, but you're kind of a nice person. That's philia. Maybe you've heard of Philadelphia. Hmm? That's the, supposed, supposed to be the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Adolphos is brother. Philia is love, the city of brotherly love. I'm told that the residents, they say, nah, it's the city of brotherly shove. But that's what they, they say about Philadelphia. I don't know. I've never lived. I've actually, I've visited there once, but I've never lived there. But Peter did not answer Jesus back with the same word. Do you love me with all your heart, mind, and soul? Yeah, I like you. That's how Peter answered back. And so Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. So then this happens again, verse 16. Jesus uses the same word, agape. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Do you really love me with all your heart, mind, and soul? Would you give your life for me? And then Peter answers him back. Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That's the philia. Philia. That's the noun philia. The verb is phileo. Okay, but I love thee, philia. I've got this affection for you. I don't have agape, but I got philia. And then Jesus says again, end of verse 16, feed my sheep. Verse 17, Jesus makes a change. And in 17, he says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Only Jesus doesn't use agape. Now Jesus uses philia. Simon, do you only philia me? Is that all I am to you? That's why Peter was grieved. That's why. Not because Jesus said it the third time, but because Jesus changed the word to his, brought it to the level down. Is that it? Is that it? Is that all there is? You just philia me? So Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, philia thou me, lovest thou me. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And he answered back philia again. Peter never did answer agape. He answers philia. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I think what we've got here is exactly what we learned from Dr. Crane. Because uh, Dr. Crane kind of showed this lady that she really did, by doing good deeds, she found that she really did love her husband. Many as a Christian leave their first love behind because they're not doing anything for Jesus. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They don't tithe. They don't come to church hardly ever. They don't serve. They got no service. They got no ministry, no job. They're not doing anything. They've taken their light and they've hid it under a bushel. No one at work even knows they're a Christian. And so what ends up happening is their, their love dies out. And it's like they leave their love behind and that's what we have before us here, folks. I want to ask you this. Do you love Jesus Christ more than you love anything else? 
because that's where it comes down. That's the bottom line. Some might say, well, pastor, I love Jesus so much, but don't ask me if I love him more than I love my husband, more than I love my wife, more than I love my children. That's not fair. I love my, my husband or my wife, my children. I love them so much. And right after them comes Jesus. Folks, that won't work. That will not work. They've become an idol of your affection. The worst thing you can do for your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your boyfriend, your, boy, your girlfriend, the worst thing you can do is put them above Jesus because then that makes them an idol. You will open yourself up to all kinds of, of attacks by the devil. You'll get fiery darts by the dozen. There's no way you can grow as a Christian if someone or something comes between you and Jesus. The very best thing you can do for your loved ones is put them in the safest place, and that's in the hands of Jesus. There's no safer place you can put your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your loved ones. Anything that's precious to you, put them into Jesus' hands quickly. Don't keep them in your own little fist. Put them into God's hands. That's the most uh, blessed and, and perfect place you can put them. God can look after them far better than you can, I can. God can do what we can. But worse, they become like little idols and prevent us from serving the Lord. So we need to ask this question. You know, let's look at it once again in verse 15. And you put your own name there. You know, Tom, Sue, whatever. Jesus says to you, you put your name there. Lovest thou me more than these? And the these could be your job your house, your career, your health. How about that? Your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter. And the simple question is, do you love Jesus more than you love any person or anything? Huh? That's a good question. Lovest thou me more than these? That's a good question that we need to get a good answer for. Lovest thou me more than the Fishing trade, that would, that's the question that Jesus asked to Simon Peter. Maybe for some of our young people, lovest thou me more than the, the games or the movies or the sports? Lovest thou me more than jobs or cars? Uh, lovest thou me more than children, more than home? Lovest thou me? Good question, isn't it? Well, before it's too late, I want to call you back. To his love. Before it's too late. You see what do you mean by that? In 1991. There was a story published about a couple named. Jeno and Alice. Jeno and Alice. Had been happily married for 36 years. And they loved each other. Jeno however suffered a stroke. And for weeks he lay in the hospital. Slipping in and out of a coma. All that time, Alice stayed right at his bedside. One night, as Alice was asleep by his bedside, Jeno woke up, came out of his coma. And he looked over and he saw his wife, Alice, sitting there asleep. He reached to his bedside stand and he took an envelope and a pen and he wrote the words to a song that they both knew. It was a song they both knew in it and liked. And here's what the words were on the envelope that Jeno wrote. Softly, I will leave you softly. For my heart would break if you should wake and see me go. So I leave you softly long before you miss me. Long before your arms can beg me stay for one more hour or one more day. After all the years, I can't bear the tears to fall, so I leave you softly. And in the story I read, in the morning when Alice awoke, Jeno had quietly passed away. So I want to call you back to your first love. If you're here today and you feel that 
You've left that first love behind you. I want to call you back into Jesus' arms before it's too late. And I want to call upon you to show your love. Jesus said, lovest thou me more than these? He said to Peter, feed my sheep. So the question, lovest thou me more than anything else? Show me. Tithe. Attend services more. Come to more church services. Get involved. Start ministering. Start helping. Be part. Get on the bandwagon. Join Soul Winners University. Lovest thou me more than these. Let's stand to our feet now, shall we?